Today, we're going to be taking a look at malware that I believe has had the biggest influence on how we look at cybersecurity today. Stay tuned. Malware is part of computing. Whether we like it or not, the threat of being infected is something we all have to deal with. Cybersecurity costs hundreds of billions of dollars a year, and there are entire careers around nothing but cybersecurity. <laughs> That's what my bachelor's degree is in. The way we view cybersecurity has been formed through experience. I'm going to go over what I believe to be the top four pieces of malware that have influenced cybersecurity the most. There's a lot of malware that I left out of this list. The majority of this list is made up of malware from the dawn of the computer security age. This list can easily be expanded, and I probably will do a follow-up on it. If there's anything that you think I should have included on this list, then please share it in the comments below. Also, stay tuned to the end of the video, and I have a particularly embarrassing piece of malware for you. Without further ado, let's get to the list. On May 5th, 2000, the most virulent virus ever created according to the Guinness Book of World Records was released onto the public. While its release may have been unintentional, it nonetheless caused 10 to $20 billion in damage and was suspected to have infected 10% of worldwide computers. This virus was the I Love You virus. Created by a pair of Filipino computer programmers, the I Love You virus would propagate due to inexperienced computer users and the new Windows 2000 default of hiding file extensions. While the ability to hide file extensions was not new to Windows 2000, this could also be done in Windows 95, it was on by default in Windows 2000. The I Love You virus would come as an email. The text of the email read, Kindly check the attached love letter coming from me. The email would include a file attachment named loveletterforyou.text.vbs. Because of the fact that Windows 2000 would hide the VBS file extension, when the file was downloaded, it appeared to be a regular text file. When this file was executed, it would immediately start duplicating itself by overwriting personal files with itself. This originally affected image files as well as audio files. It would then make changes to the Windows registry, followed by sending itself to everyone in your email client's contact list. Since this virus was based on a Visual Basic script, it was easy to modify, so there were many different versions of this virus. Some versions of this virus would replace critical Windows files instead of personal files, leaving your computer unusable. At the time this virus was released, there were no anti-malware laws in the Philippines, so the creators who were arrested were never actually charged. This, however, did lead to anti-malware laws being passed. On July 15, 2001, a worm that specifically targeted Windows web servers was discovered. This worm was named Code Red, named after the popular Mountain Dew drink of the same name that was being drank by the security researchers who discovered it. This worm ultimately affected 16% of all Windows web servers on the internet. This made up 1% of total web servers because most web servers were based on Linux, which wasn't affected by the worm. Ultimately, this worm is assumed to have affected 300,000 websites by replacing their homepage with the text that read, Welcome to Worm.com, hacked by Chinese. Even though this worm would replace the homepage on websites, it didn't actually harm any files on the hard drive. The worm ran completely in memory. Once the worm replaced a website's homepage, it would randomly generate 99 IP addresses in search for more IIS servers to infect. The worm would then launch a denial of service attack on the whitehouse.gov website's IP address. This may have been an oversight on the creator's part because all the White House website had to do was change their IP address to stop the denial of service attacks. However, this led to a lot of panicking that actually led to the Air Force shutting down their entire IT infrastructure at one point. The worm would propagate through a buffer overload in Windows IIS version 5. At the time, this security vulnerability had already been discovered and a patch was released. Unfortunately, the patch was not installed by many servers allowing this worm to propagate. 
It's estimated that this worm cost $2.4 billion in damage. However, recovering from the worm was actually quite simple. Since the virus only affected system memory, the affected server simply needed to be rebooted, and once rebooted, the required security patch needed to be installed to avoid the server from being reinfected. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? No one knows who created Code Red. Some believe it was the Chinese government because, you know, of the text that replaced websites' homepages that simply said, hacked by Chinese. However, this very well could have been a red herring. The Chinese government denies any involvement in Code Red, and honestly, it could have been anyone. We may never know. It was March 26, 1999. This was the last year of the decade that started the internet. Since 1993, AOL had been sending floppy disks in what will later be known as the largest and most aggressive direct mailing campaign in history. Everyone was getting on the internet, but what people weren't doing is understanding the dangers of the internet. It was the perfect timing for the Melissa virus. The Melissa virus was more embarrassing than destructive. You would receive an unsuspecting email in your inbox from someone that you knew. The subject line simply read, important message. When you open the email, you were greeted with the text, here's your document you asked for, don't show anyone else, followed by a text winking emoji. The email came with an attachment named list.doc. Once you open this attachment, a bunch of porn sites would open up on your computer and the virus would send itself to the first 50 people in your address book. You know, generally it's not a good idea to click on any internet offers that you haven't requested. The embarrassing part about the virus is that the people who received it believed it came from you. Let's hope your mother wasn't one of the first 50 people in your address book. The Melissa virus propagated using the macro system in Microsoft Word. Macros are used by Microsoft Word to be able to perform repetitive tasks. If you need to make the same edit several times in a single document, you could create a macro to create these edits for you. This was a very powerful system as the Melissa virus proved. Ultimately, the Melissa virus caused about 80 million in damage. It didn't actually cause any damage to the computers that it affected, and the majority of that money was based on loss of productivity and the massive overload that email servers had to deal with because of the virus. The programmer who created the Melissa virus was caught about a week after the virus was released. He was sentenced to 20 months in prison and had to pay a $5,000 fine. He said that he named the Melissa virus after a stripper that he had met in Miami, Florida. Sounds like he was kind of a perv. On April 30th, 2004, many Windows users were greeted with a shutdown timer telling them that the LSASS service had crashed. I was among those users. This worm would be known as Sasser. The Sasser worm wasn't incredibly destructive to the system itself, but it was quite annoying. It actually turned into a very disruptive virus. It affected millions of computers and led to taking down critical infrastructures like airlines, news agencies, public transportation, hospitals, and even universities. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Sasser would propagate by connecting to vulnerable computers by the TCP port 445 and 139. The vulnerability in which Sasser exploited had already been patched, and it's speculated that Sasser was created by actually reverse engineering the patch itself. The reason why Sasser was able to infect so many computers was because not many computers had installed the security patch. This is why Windows Update is so important. It's estimated the Sasser worm caused about $18 billion in damage. Also, I personally believe that it was because of the Sasser worm that we now have the Windows Firewall. It was just four months later when Microsoft released Windows XP Service Pack 2, which included the Windows Firewall. It was very unusual for a Service Pack to change the functionality of Windows itself. Typically, service packs were nothing more than a collection of bug fixes and security updates. However, Windows XP Service Pack 2 broke the mold by including the Windows Firewall, which I believe to be a direct response to the Sasser worm. 
The Sasser worm was created by a 17-year-old German boy. Authorities were tipped off to the creator because one of his friends informed Microsoft that he knew who created the worm. He did this to receive the $250,000 bounty offered by Microsoft. Authorities arrested the boy, who turned out to also be the creator of the NetSky worm. Because he was under 18 when he wrote the virus, he received a 21-month suspended sentence. As I said at the beginning of the video, malware is just part of life. The internet is probably one of the biggest revolutions in human history. It has given us the ability to communicate and do commerce globally. The connectivity that we have today has been a tremendous benefit to mankind. However, that benefit has not come to us without its downsides. We will always have to deal with security issues. The more connected we get as a society, the more security issues are going to affect us. The malware industry can trace its roots back to some pretty intelligent people that were just trying to get bragging rights. Many early viruses were written for the sole purpose of someone being able to say, I did that. Many of these people grew up and decided to make a career out of it. Today, malware isn't as obnoxious as it used to be. That's because it's harder to make money off of obnoxious malware. Today, malware is used as monetization. So instead of viruses like Melissa opening up a bunch of porn sites and then emailing the list off to your family and friends, today it just tries to steal your credit card number. So we must stay vigilant in keeping our computer secure. I did a video a while back where I go through the steps to keep yourself secure on the internet. I'll go ahead and tag that video right here. I urge you to take a look at it. While we're here, I just wanted to let you know that I also have a website at CyberCPU Tech. This website includes all of the show notes from the videos on this page. Eventually, I'll have merch on this website as well. In the meantime, all the shirts that I wear in these videos are available in a link in the description below. Also, follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at CyberCPU, as well as Instagram at CyberCPU as well. Now, for that bonus malware I promised you. In September 2011, Apple had to stop claiming their operating system was immune from viruses. Apple had been able to use their lack of viruses as marketing against Microsoft Windows for a long time. Unfortunately, thanks to the flashback Trojan, this marketing seemed kind of outdated. Do not be a hero. Last year there are 114,000 known viruses for PCs. PCs, not Macs. So, you just grab this. Hey, I think I got to crash. Hey, if you feel like that'll help. The flashback Trojan would disguise itself as a fake installer for the Adobe Flash Player. The flashback Trojan ended up infecting 600,000 Apple computers. However, luckily, because Apple's have a Unix-like structure, the Trojan was only able to affect the user account that was originally infected. The flashback virus formed a botnet that actually included 274 bots in Apple's hometown of Cupertino, California. This Trojan was created by a 30-year-old man from Russia. As of the recording of this video, I do not believe he's been brought to justice, but he sure did embarrass Apple. If you enjoyed this video, then please like it. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified of future videos. I post a new video every week. Hey, and while you're here, take a look at some of these videos up here. Have a great day.